This is the Zizek Dictionary entry for Real, Symbolic, Imaginary, by Dwayne Roussel. Lacan described a tripartite structure of being that was summarized with reference to the Baromian knot. The structure was such that if any one ring was cut and separated, then the entirety of the knot would come undone and induce psychosis in the subject. However, the integrity of the rings may be maintained during psychosis by way of the introduction of a fourth ring, named the synthome. The synthome was uniquely identified in the writings of James Joyce, whose jouissance appropriated and thus foreclosed the symbolic. Each independent ring of the knot was associated with one of the three orders of being, real, symbolic, and imaginary. Zizek's intervention involved the elucidation of the relationship within and between these three orders of being through carefully applied references to popular films such as Alien, The Silence of the Lambs, and Vertigo. Zizek has also made use of the analogy of chess to explain the three orders. We can relate the symbolic order to the rules that a chess player has to follow in order to play the game competently. For example, a king can only move one square in any direction per turn, and it cannot, by the player's hand, be made vulnerable to a checkmate. This rule is woven into the symbolic fabric of the game, and without it the game is strictly unplayable. At the imaginary level, the silhouette of each figure may be sutured to the respective symbolic law. For example, the rules of play for the knight may be sutured to the piece whose silhouette corresponds most closely with the silhouette of a horse. However, each of us knows at some level that this pairing is entirely contingent, inasmuch as the rules of play associated with the knight could just as easily be sutured to the silhouette of a hobbit or a donkey. Who among us has not, as a consequence of misplacing a piece, exchanged it for a simple object such as a coin? The very name, knight, may just as easily be changed to donkey without any harm to the respective symbolic rules of play. Finally, the real refers to all of those contingent circumstances surrounding the game, such as the weather, unpredictable interruptions, for example a phone call, a washroom break, the skill sets of the players, and so on. In more precise terms, the symbolic refers to the realm of the law that regulates the subject's desire. Thus, the symbolic is first and foremost a place or locus within which the law is manifest. Insofar as the subject's desire is the desire of the other, it is the law of the other, elsewhere this is named the big other, that establishes the subject qua desire. Moreover, the symbolic has the unique responsibility, as law, of maintaining the subject's distance from the primordial thing of the real. The place within which we find the law is also thereby the place within which we find the signifier, and the status of the signifier within the symbolic is such that no fixed relationship between itself and a signified is made possible. It is upon this Lacanian foundation that Zizek has subsequently built his theory of the decline of symbolic efficiency under contemporary capitalism. Zizek argues that the big other of the symbolic law has always been something like a collective myth. This collective myth functions according to the logic of disavowal. For example, some young children merely pretend to believe in Santa Claus so as not to disappoint their parents. Moreover, the parents desperately want their children to believe, and so they are willing to pretend their belief. The result is that nobody believes in Santa Claus, and yet the tradition nonetheless persists. When our belief towards the Big Other remains at this level of disavowal, it is our material practices that sustain the belief in our place. Similarly, when our attitudes towards the Big Other remain at the level of cynicism, the result is that we project a belief in an other of the Big Other who must be pulling the strings of the original 
big other. At the very least, this explains the paradoxical mixture of cynicism towards major government institutions, with the equally dangerous belief that there must be a secret and more powerful government of the government pulling the strings. The imaginary has its bearing in the symbolic, insofar as the signifier provides the materials with which the imaginary sutures its signified into place. In some sense, the imaginary is responsible for providing our everyday experience with some consistency. In another sense, things are perhaps a bit more complicated. For instance, the Freudian ego is an instantiation of the Lacanian imaginary insofar as the ego is formed through the specular image of the mirror. However, another image is formed when we imagine ourselves as if we are being looked at by the big other from the location of his gaze. Moreover, we have an image constructed via the transferential relationship between the image we have of the big other. For example, the big other reduced to a little other, and the image we have of ourselves, an image formed by the belief that the big other is not lacking. It is at this level that fantasy operates. The real is without any doubt one of the most elusive concepts in the work of Lacan and Zizek. To be certain, the real is the place within which the thing is located, but it is also the place of objet petit a. Zizek and Lacan have made it abundantly clear that the two, that the two concepts, dosting and objet petit a, are not necessarily the same. Zizek noted this difference with brilliant clarity when he noted that the thing is the object of the real in its absolutely inconceivable reality, an objet petit a is the residue of the real after the onset of the symbolic order. In other words, the former is the primordial object before the symbolic, and the latter is the elusive object that occurs as a consequence of the symbolic order. In any case, it is clear that the real of objet petit a has its place within the lack of the symbolic order, while the real of das Ding has its place in the primordial real, as that which is not at all lacking. There is nothing lacking in the primordial real. The symbolic cuts into the real, but only from the place of desire and law. However, we must be very careful to qualify this obscure relationship. The real has as its unique property an inability to be cut. This means that the cut by the symbolic is a cut only from the place of the symbolic. Finally, it is from this place of the symbolic that the intrusion of the real has its anxiety-provoking effect. The encounter with the real, touché, from the place of the symbolic and imaginary, can provoke only anxiety in the subject. In fact, some of Zizek's most notable contributions regarding the study of the real come from his Schellingian belief that the real operates as a limit to the completeness of imaginary and symbolic reality. Some have gone so far as to claim that Zizek's real project has been to use the real symbolic imaginary triad to reread all of the tradition of German idealism. The precise nature of each of the orders of being is not exactly intuitive, because each of the corresponding rings is knotted together and is thus mutually interdependent. Zizek corrected this simplistic and naive reading of the three orders from his earlier book, The Sublime Object of Ideology, in the lengthy preface to his later book, For They Know Not What They Do. In other words, there are points of intersection between any two of the rings, and these points of intersection are what we make up the logic of the knot and its corresponding orders. In this way, all three of the previous orders may be better described through the following concepts. Real, real, symbolic, symbolic, and imaginary, imaginary. Moreover, there are, in all actuality, nine configurations, including real, real, real symbolic, real imaginary, 
symbolic real, symbolic symbolic, symbolic imaginary, imaginary real, imaginary symbolic, and imaginary imaginary. Once again, Zizek's main point of intervention was to provide his readers with useful examples relating to the intersections that occur primarily with the real ring. The real real is the place within which we find the primordial and elusive thing, named as Das Ding. Recall that for Lacan, Das Ding was that which lacked a signifier. In so far as they signified depends upon the effect of the play of signifiers, then that which lacks a signifier also thereby lacks a signified. Das Ding is beyond the signified. If, therefore, Das Ding is beyond the signified, then it by necessity has its place in the real. It proves important to avoid the conflation of Das Ding with the real, insofar as the latter refers to the place within which we find the real object as the thing. It is of some importance to highlight this point. Das Ding is the object that occurs in the place of the real, and it has as its most elementary property the withdrawal from symbolization. The symbolic real can best be demonstrated by way of the symbolic inscription of quantum formula. These formula remain senseless and unimaginable to us in our common everyday experience, and yet they are nonetheless unquestionably realistic from the point of view of modern mathematics and physics. This at least explains Zizek's decades-long fascination with quantum physics and his intellectual solidarity with the mathematical ontology of Alain Badu. A more simplistic, perhaps naive, example of the symbolic real comes to us by way of Bertrand Russell's well-known paradox, in which a barber shaves all those who do not shave themselves. This paradox expresses the gap separating a set from itself. Symbolically, this has been expressed as follows. X does not belong to X. The set of all sets cannot include itself within the set. We should note, however, that Lacan refused to accept the premise that this was a logical paradox. Rather, he referred to it as an image. See on this Lacan's 14th seminar on the logic of fantasy. Finally, the imaginary real is that part of an image that disrupts the very integrity of the image in toto. Recently, Zizek has provided his readers with an example, by way of the great revolutionary painting by Jacques-Louis David, The Death of Marat. This painting, designated by Zizek as the first modern painting, has, for half of its image, complete darkness. In the darkness, the viewer can find only death, anxiety, and nothingness. Zizek believes that the painting uses this nothingness as the space for thinking rather than narrativization. In other words, the painting resists the counter-revolutionary impulse to construct a narrative in place of the void. One such narrative may be, he is dying, but he knows that his death will be a small contribution to French people finally enjoying freedom. The imaginary real is thereby that place within the image which introduces a division. This division threatens the very integrity of the image qua image by reducing it to the pure division of the real.